we are going to start with Advent today, and we've got three weeks of Advent leading up to Christmas. Advent is a time of preparation, and it's a time of reflection. The word Advent comes from the Latin Adventus, which means arrival. And Christmas is the time where we remember the arrival of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. This arrival of Jesus that we kind of reflect on over these next few weeks was prophesied 700 years before Christ would arrive by the prophet Isaiah, and it's recorded in the Old Testament book of Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, where Isaiah says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. As our wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace, he brings hope, he brings love, and he brings peace into our lives. And as part of the Advent journey, that time of reflection, what we do is leading up to Christmas, we look at each of these things that Christ has brought us in his arrival. And today I want to look specifically at how Christ has brought us hope, hope through his arrival into the human flesh. And there are two important understandings we as followers of Jesus need to embrace when it comes to hope. Because the idea of hope has become such a flimsy word used so easily for anything. And so the first thing we must understand about what hope means for us as followers of Jesus is that hope is placed in someone, not in something. And the second thing we need to know is that our hope inspires us to endure the storms we can't escape. And in some ways, those two concepts seem to contradict what we thought hope meant. And that's why it's important to understand them as a follower of Jesus and how they apply to our lives. So firstly, our hope is placed in someone, not something. Often we unknowingly place our hope in something, a desired outcome or we hope that the results aren't negative, or we hope that the provision will come through. And then if things don't work out as we had hoped for, we blame God. Your God, I'd hoped you would have like provided, and your word says, but where were you for me? Don't I matter anymore? I don't even know if I believe in you, because your hopes were dashed. Your hopes were in something. And God, the someone, didn't provide the something you had hoped for. After Jesus' crucifixion, in Luke chapter 24, verse 6, two angels um, say to Mary, Joanna, and a few other women as they approach to Jesus' tomb to prepare his dead body for burial, that the angel said, he isn't here anymore. He has risen from the dead. So they're like so pumped up. And they're like, woo, this is amazing. We just saw two angels. Jesus is alive. And they run back to the 11 disciples to tell them the good news. And the response of the disciples at hearing this from Mary is documented in Luke chapter 24, verse 11. It says this, but the story sounded like nonsense to the men. So they didn't believe it. It's like, you're right, angels appeared and he's alive. They failed to believe that Jesus was alive because the story didn't make sense to their human understanding. The outcome wasn't what they had hoped for. Their hopes of a king who would conquer were dashed by Christ's crucifixion and what looked like a hopeless situation. Why would I believe God's victorious in this? It sounds like nonsense. And it wasn't only those disciples who felt this way about the whole situation or the outcome, the something they had expected which didn't work out. There were two followers of Jesus who were on their way to Emmaus that day, and and Jesus suddenly came walking alongside them because as the angels had told us, he was alive. But they didn't recognize him. And and then he asked them while he walked with them to Emmaus, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? And they replied in Luke chapter 24 from verse 18 saying, the one of them, Cleopas, replied to Jesus, said, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things, the some things that have happened there the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. 
are the things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people, but our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. We had hoped. We had hoped that like something would have happened in that situation because God came through. We had hoped. God, I had hope. You said in the word that I must have my hope in you. Well, I had hoped for something and nothing happened. We had hoped. These two men were hoping for something different to have happened concerning the death of Jesus while in the presence of the someone who had already overcome its power. That's crazy. These two men were hoping for something different to have happened concerning the death of Jesus while in the presence of the someone who had already overcome its power. These men had a hope that had been misplaced in a situation instead of the Savior. They had put their hope in something, not someone. This is why Jesus earlier had said before his death in John chapter 16 from verse 33, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. It wasn't like there weren't going to be periods of painful crucifixion. It's not like you were never going to experience seasons of suffering like the crucifixion. It wasn't like you were just going to live in resurrection. It's like, hey, in this world you will have troubles, but take heart, I've overcome. The same way Jesus had overcome the grave. But the idea of that story sounded like such nonsense that people couldn't believe it because they put their hope in something working out through this guy called the Savior instead of putting it in the Savior himself who would transcend the trial of the crucifixion leading to the victorious resurrection. So in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart because I've overcome the world. And while you're sitting broken by hopes that were dashed in something, you may still be standing in the presence of the someone that's there to save you. God's words that speak hope into our hearts are this. Who I am is greater than what you're going through. Oh God, I had hoped it would have worked out. Don't worry, put your hope in me because who I am is greater than what you're going through. Some of you are sitting here now and you're like, oh, Grant, you don't know how much I've gone through this year. You don't know how difficult it's been. Who he is is greater than what you're going through. Therefore, somehow, even in the storm, you can take heart because your hope no longer has to be placed in something. It can be placed in someone. In the New Testament book of 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10, Paul the Apostle actually writes about this when he says, we have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all men. We don't place our hope in some things, we place our hope in someone, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Our hope is in someone, not something, and so we as followers of Jesus should often reflect on this question for our own lives. What have I placed my hope in? The object of my faith or outcomes? What have I placed my hope in? Jesus, my Lord and Savior, the object of my faith, the person I follow, or outcomes? God, I need you to do stuff for me, and and my hope is in that stuff happening the way I want it to. But Jesus never promised you it's all going to be okay. In fact, he said, in this world, you will have trouble. But because your hope's in him, you can take heart, because he's already overcome the problem that you might be facing.
This question leads us to that second understanding of hope that's very important for each of us as followers of Jesus. We don't only place our hope in someone rather than something, but as followers of Jesus, our hope inspires us to endure when we can't escape the storm. In the context of the early church in Thessalonica, the author writes of of the church in 1 Thessalonians from chapter 1, we remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in, look, it's someone, not something, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Endurance inspired by hope. Instead of wishfully thinking about the positive outcomes we want, our hope is in who God is, regardless of our circumstances. It's placed in someone, meaning we are inspired to endure the storms by that very hope. Our hope is anchored in understanding that we've won the war even when we lose the battles which may require us to endure. And endurance, because at the end of that stormy season is the victorious deliverance of your Savior, the one in which your hope is actually placed. Every period of suffering in your life is a season and not a life sentence because your life sentence was removed through the grace of our Lord and Savior who replaced us on the cross defeating the death we deserved. That means suffering can never be a life sentence for you, only a season, meaning that you need to allow the hope in your Savior at the end of your story of battle to be the reason you endure so that you can read the final chapter of the victory in a war he's already won. When lost battles in your life leave you feeling weak and weary, The same prophet who prophesied of Jesus' birth 700 years before Isaiah speaks to us out of Isaiah chapter 40, 31, where he says, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. In other words, they do need to run. And there are times where their strength needs to be renewed because in this world you will have trouble, but you don't get stuck in your suffering. You endure by a hope because it's placed in the someone on the other side of the season you're walking through. And so we hope in the Lord and suddenly we renew our strength. We soar on the wings like eels. We run and don't grow weary. We walk and we don't faint. And the phrase, those who hope, in the Hebrew means those that wait for. God, I'm in the storm. I'm not trying to escape, but I'm waiting for you to come through because my hope is not placed in the storm disappearing. It's placed in the Savior who's in the midst of my storm. Because of our hope in someone, Jesus, We can find peace while enduring the waiting in the some things. Imagine what it was like for those early followers of Jesus, waiting, hoping after Jesus was defeated on the cross. Imagine that period before he would manifest victorious in resurrection when all they could see was the defeat of crucifixion, what looked like a hopeless situation. They needed to hope in the Lord. They needed to wait for because, because their hope had to be in someone. It couldn't be in the something because the situation would have defeated them. Our hope is in someone so we can find peace while enduring the waiting in the some things. And I don't know what your something looks like right now. What situation you didn't expect that has left you feeling hopeless. But you're called to wait for the one in which your hope has been placed. Because of our hope in someone, Jesus, we can find peace while enduring the waiting in the some things, like the hallway of the hospital for our chemo treatment, or the periods of inner depression which tempt us to give up. We can endure the waiting through the tears, weeping at the betrayal of someone we trusted, and we can wait on this earth Assuredly, after losing loved ones 
Because for a follower of Jesus, waiting isn't wishfully thinking about things turning out the way we want them. It's about the certain knowledge of a war that has been won regardless of the battles we may need to endure. And even in enduring through the process of our final death, still our hope remains. Because the one in which our hope is placed says to us from John chapter 11, 25, I am the resurrection and the life and anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Therefore, like the psalmist writes in Psalm 23 verse 4, even when walking through the dark valley of death, I will not be afraid for you are close beside me, guarding, guiding all the way. This is our hope. This is our hope. You see, hope means we may weep as we endure in the waiting while still having full confidence in how the story will end because of what our Savior has done. God, how can I hope in such a hopeless situation? My child, you can do that because who I am is greater than what you're going through. Who I am is greater than what you're going through. Even if your something smells like death, I've already defeated it. So what greater foe could come against you? Who I am is greater than what you're going through. This is the hope which we have been given through Christ's arrival. A hope that anchors our hearts in the middle of our storms, not in their absence. As the New Testament book of Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19 tells us, this certain hope of being saved is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls, connecting us with God himself behind the sacred curtains of heaven. Our testimony to the world through our lives is not in the absence of the storms others face, but our souls being anchored in the middle of the storms we may have to endure. Christians have always thought the testimony was in showing everyone else how much breakthrough they could have if they were just a believer. It's about this profound dynamic of an anchored peace in your soul in the middle of a storm that your friends are busy drowning in. It's them going, I don't understand. You are suffering. You're even crying. You know, Christians have thought their testimony is, I'll show everyone how strong the Lord makes you. Or maybe it's when you're sitting weeping over the doctor's diagnosis pausing to wipe away the tears, taking a deep breath and just remember, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for you are with me. And they sit there going, I don't understand where this is coming from in the middle of your storm. The testimony is that there's an anchor for your soul. It's found in the someone, the savior of the world, Jesus the creator of the universe that calls us back into intimate relationship with him. Author John Mark Green once said something which just spoke to me in this context. He said, you are not the darkness you endured. You are the light that refused to surrender. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In our darkness, we put our hope in the light that we walk with. And somehow we can endure 
Because even in the darkest place is the glimmer of light and the presence of a God that delivers us through the valley of the shadow of death. This is our hope. Your suffering is a season, not a life sentence. So may you endure with your hope in the God who walked on the waters of the storm.